All right. Uh, a lot of uh, stories begin and the protagonist's parents are dead, but what happens when you have live parents? And this is the question we're going to answer. So things to consider with live parents, I guess we'll just start with what defines a parent. Do you have one living parent, both parents living, or a blended family with multiple mothers and fathers? Uh, step parents, adoptive parents, foster parents, biological parents, they all count. Um, we've kind of put together a list of different kinds of parents. Um, we've got regular mom and dad, single parent, platonic parents, so I guess friends that ask, act as parents, adopted parents, foster parents, a sibling that acts as a parent, uh, a divine dad or mom and Darth dad or mom, aka demon dad or mom. So uh, who wants to start out uh, with your thoughts on some of those types of parents? Well, Do you want to start out, Jacob? Yeah, let me uh, just uh, start with... Uh... Some, some music here. I don't know if you can hear it. It's um, very soft. Yeah, right. Uh, Darth Vader is, uh, I mean, it's just one of the really important characters and an important person that's a, that's a parent. It's not the right type of parent, but um, the whole idea of a Darth dad or a demon dad is is really, really popular. And it used to be really popular for you know, kids always have to be orphans. And way back in 1977, you know, Star Wars came out and said, hey, Luke's an orphan. But then a couple of years later, out came the second movie. And guess what? He's not really an orphan. They took that trope and threw it on its head, right? And that was one of the reasons, I mean, people talk about that moment that Darth Vader said, Luke, I am your father, as one of the greatest moments in filming history because they took this trope and threw it on its head and, and he had a dad and he is Darth Vader. And that's, you know, that was the genesis of the Darth dad. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, having your, your parent be your antagonist is uh, an interesting twist to that whole thing. Um, I know with some of my characters, um, I have parents that are effective and ineffective, and some that are missing and some that are dead. So um, what about uh, Allison in your writings? What is your favorite type to use? Um, well, I write middle grade. So um, I write stories about um, kids, and I, which means I can't ever get around the parent question because these kids, unless they're orphans, unless they are physically separated from parental figures, they are living in the same house most of the time, or very, very much affected by parents. Um, with kids who are about eight to twelve years old, which is my age, my reading range for my books. Um, mm -hmm. Parents are enormously important figures in their lives. And so in my books, uh, my first two books are about a kid who was a thief for hire at his middle school. And so the parents in those books work as kind of a soft antagonist. He basically is just trying not to let them know what he's doing. Um, but in later books that I've been, been, been writing, um, I've got a book coming out in, um, yeah, I think it's, oh, it's, it's early 2022 called Secrets of Stone and Sea, in which two boys essentially raise Cthulhu by accident. And their parents are part of the team. They uh, they tell their parents what's going on. The parents help them. And in that one, I'm using the parents as a helpline, um, but one that's not able to take over and fix the problem for them. Um, in my writing, so I I typically use, I like, I like stories where the parents are um, either an antagonist like a Darth dad or a soft antagonist like, um, you know, the kids don't want their parents to find out about something, the don't tell mom. 
soft antagonist, but I'm enjoying writing this story where the kids are um, have a support system in their parents, and the parents are there and they're helping them. Um, but these kids are learning that their parents can't solve every problem for them, and so that's been a dynamic. And this, this book that will be coming out in a couple of years, in a year actually. Okay, what about you, Charlie? <clears throat> I like to write all sorts of different types of parents. The reason I'm on this panel is because I, with my first series, I wrote totally within the trope where I killed off the mom in the first chapter. And then I had a, a fairly disconnected father figure that then my main character goes off to another world. He's able to open wormholes. So he goes off to another world. And so his father isn't around to help. And there are reasons you, do that like the trope is there for a reason because it it helps you make your main characters work hard to achieve what they're they're going for but in my second series i really wanted to toss out the trope a little bit so i wrote uh foster parents so i have two pr protagonists so i have foster parents over one of my protagonists and then a godmother over another protagonist and they are very much involved and very helpful, which makes writing the book much harder because you have to work around them because it still has to be on your protagonist's shoulders. They still have to work through the conflict and achieve their goals and, and do the things. But, but I didn't want parents who were totally checked out or dead. And so the, the foster parents actually turned out to be a fun couple that I love writing them, but I do have to put um, conflict and thing in the way to keep them from helping the kids out as much as they want to, because it still has to fall on, on the protagonist. Right, what about well, you, Kaylee? I was just thinking, um, I, I kind of do what Allison does, where I like to have the parents involved, whether it's negatively or positively. Um, and I do have one story where um, the boy doesn't know his dad, so he was raised by by um, his dad's friend. And so he, well, he knows him, but he doesn't know it's his dad. And so technically speaking, he kind of has two dads. Um, he's got the friend who kind of became a godfather and then his actual blood father that is more like an antagonist to him. And so um, kind of creating that, that um, mix of parents and how involved um, that friend really became that father figure that he needed. And when he found out that, you know, the other guy was his dad, he was more attached to the friend. And so that's that's kind of how I like to connect um, how parents or some somewhere acting as parents can be involved in my stories. Right. I I have a friend who uh, his main characters are young boys like eleven and fourteen and and when they're doing stuff around the parent and not telling their mom what's going on things go downhill fast and when they start involving their mother and telling her what's going on and getting some advice things get better and it, it's really refreshing to see that and you're not screaming at the book go tell your mother <laughs> but um i i kind of have a variety um I have one character that his mother is alive and he can communicate to her through the dragons, but she's off across the mountains in a different place. And so she can't really help him much. And it, it, it's interesting when he finally gets a more parental figure than the, the, grandfatherly dragon that his father left behind and so it's it's interesting and i have ones that the parents are living but they can and can't help so yeah it's that kind of brings us to 
is having a live parent an asset or a liability for the protagonist? We're moving Ariadne. And then, and what kind of uh, relationship is it? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it active, passive, close, distant, nurturing, or even abusive? Okay, yes. it looks like we're getting Ariadne. There Ariadne she is. Fair. Yay. Oh, okay. Ariadne, that's technical issues. <laughs> We've been discussing types of parents. And uh, so I guess I'll ask you first, Ariadne, is having a living parent an asset or a liability for the protagonist and what kind of relationship? Um, does the, the protagonist have with the parent? It, whether they're an asset or a liability kind of does depend on the relationship that they have. Obviously, if they have a good relationship with their parent, that becomes both an asset and a liability because they have a sounding board or they have someone who cares about them and can help them. Um, or versus if they don't have a good relationship, obviously that becomes um, a little bit more of an antagonistic relationship um, and can hinder. Um, sorry. Well, if you have a caring parent that you're close to and you rely on, that raises the stakes in that if they are threatened, your protagonist is, goes much. into protective mode. What What are the the risks there. I mean, um, I, I mean you could also have, go ahead, Allison. I mean, you could also have a, a, a parent with a relationship that's a good relationship that still becomes a liability for the protagonist if the parent, parental figure um, becomes smothering. Um, like if the kid or the protagonist has to do something that's dangerous and the very loving parent wants to take this away from the kid and maybe. Um, pushes them out of their own story or tries to um, keep prevent them, hold them back from doing what they have to do. That can be a liability too. A well-meaning, loving liability, but a liability nonetheless. Right. Actually, I have a story similar to what Allison said um, about like the mom kind of pulls back the protagonist from, from accomplishing her objective. <clears throat> Right, and then, then the the parent becomes the barrier. Um, what about you, uh, Jacob? Well, um, it's Jared. Sorry, um, and or Jared. Sorry, <laughs> I do have a brother named Jacob, and I grew up being called Jacob, so it was kind of funny <laughs> that you chose that name to, to be wrong, because I was little Jacob for my whole life. Um, so I think characters, uh, parents, parents can have so many different dynamics and, and relationships. And I would like to bring up Stranger Things um, in there. Every single kid, except for 11, has parents, right? Every one of them. And they all behave differently. You have the parent of, you know, the, the kid that was lost and... You know, she at first appears psycho, but she is dedicated to saving her son. And then you have the other parents who are just kind of in the background. And and it works around all of them. It gives you so many different examples of parents, how to deal with parents in, in a story. And if you want to write really good parents in a story, you should watch that series and analyze each parent and how they were treated, what the relationship was and what part they took play they took in the story and i want to hop off that and say in stranger things trying without giving too many spoilers away even 11 has relationships with parents that are important to the plot so right what about you charlie um i was actually thinking of stranger things too uh, just they do such a good job of having some parents being helpful some being a little checked out, some being smothering, and but the writers do a really good job of creating barriers between the protagonists and their parents in some way. And so for one, they're in completely different worlds, 
And so they're not actually interacting, but she's trying to be super helpful. She's a helpful, dedicated mom, but she can't help because she's separated from him. And then some of the other ones, they're separated by uh, typical childhood fears where they're like, if they find out, we're going to get in trouble or they're going to take our new friend away from us. Like there are reasons that these kids aren't sharing things with their parents and to do even like good, helpful parents. Well, you have to create some barriers between your protagonists and your parents so they can forward the plot. Right. Okay, I guess we could go to our next question of does the protagonist respect or defy the parents' advice and wishes? All of the above. So, <laughs> all of the above, yes. And, and what's interesting is it's all of the above yes. can be good and bad, and each one of them can be good and bad. Like Luke Skywalker defied his dad's wishes of going to the dark side, and that was good. But in like Fablehaven, Seth defied his grandparents and nearly destroyed Fablehaven, right? So so defying can be both good and bad, and, and it's hard to know which. I'm, I'm sitting here you, thinking Allison? about that. I'm just sitting here thinking about that scene in in uh, Tangled where Rapunzel leaves the tower for the first time and is defied from her mother, and has a has a crisis about it. I I don't know. I'm just sitting. I'm thinking that the way that a kid acts, I mean, the way that they 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 think about defying the parents could really show that relationship and really show the characterization of the, the child. Like, is this a rebellious child who's like? you know, mom tells them to do something as simple as take their socks off the floor and they're like, not going to do it. Or is it somebody who uh, feels this uh, loyalty or feels like they really need to obey their parents and get put in a situation where they have to choose to defy them? That could be really interesting. Um, and I guess it's also interesting to have the, uh, I'm a terrible human being. I can't believe I did this. <laughs> Tangled back and forth discussion. I, I don't I'm thinking of right now. Love that scene. Well, what about you, Ariadne? If you think about most kids, they're actually a pretty good split of that, the rebellious and the, the obedient. Um, you know, they they kind of pick and choose depending on what it is they want to do, whether or not they think that they're, you know, that they know more than the parent does or whether the whatever it is that they're doing has more appeal than say nay, any consequences that they would receive from said parent um you know my my main character in my first novel um he obeys the rules in ways that aren't necessarily the smartest ways of doing things like he decides i'm going to try and jump the stairs on our porch with my skateboard but then you know he understands that there are consequences to this but you know he didn't the parents didn't necessarily say that he couldn't skateboard on the property. They just said he couldn't leave the property. So, you know, there, there's that, <laughs> that give and take in, in most kids where. The letter of the law something. versus the spirit of the law. Exactly. Yeah, kids want to find those boundaries, right? Yeah. What about you, Kaylee? Well, I, I was just thinking um, kind of since Allison mentioned Tangled, I was thinking of Brave. Brave is another example where the mom is very involved and she defies her mom. And because she defies her mom, then that resulted to the plot line of the story um, and all of that and how, how she ends up from defying her mom to actually helping her mom. And um, just seeing, seeing how much the parent is involved in that. And um, I know we all kind of followed along the theme of defying parents and the pros and cons of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of how most of my stories happen when I have the parents is, is the kid, kid defies something. And um, at some point they realize that they're more reliant on their parents than they thought. Right. What about you, Charlie, and your stories? Um, I like to Do you have defiant kids or I obedient? have 
I have fairly defiant kids, but they have streaks of obedience. I have, uh, in my most recent series, um, I have two protagonists and I switch back and forth between them. And one of them has a godmother that she really respects and loves. And she tries really hard to do everything that she asks of her. And then I have the foster parents and my foster kid begrudgingly respects the foster parents. And so he defies them sometimes like, um, he won't take out the trash if they ask him to, but he'll take it out if they don't. And so he does little things like that where he's like, like I'm going to do it my way. And at some point, um, I need the parents out of the way in my story and because they're too helpful. And um, so the godmother actually helps the two kids betray the, the other parents to ditch them and go to the other world. Um, because she understands that they need to do that. This is their journey. They need to do it. And so she kind of works against the other parents in this way. And so they, they still end up being defiant, but also they're respecting her wishes and defying the other parents. And so I, I like to mix it up. Um, now I'm saying, uh, that's I'm, great. Yeah. I just wanted to bring up, uh, just Go ahead. I just thought of, um, Thanos in the Marvel movies with his, kids with Gamora and Nebula and their uh, how in that case um, defiance is actually the good thing to do I think it, I don't know I, I think it'd be interesting to see more stories where the kid is starts out obedient and then has to choose defiance maybe that's the right thing to do right right well we've already, already kind of covered how does having live parents change the story because they, they color the actions of the protagonist. So what impact would the parent dying in the middle of the story have on the protagonist and the plot? We'll just skip ahead to that. I, I love it when... I, well, the first thing, you can't kill a parent if you don't have parents already. So it's, I, I think it's so right. important to start out with them. Um, and I can, I can go into some really, really great examples. And um, I kind of made Darth Vader a little bit of a theme because in my book, well, my main character calls his dad a Darth dad, and that's where that term came from. But, uh, you know, at the very end of Star Wars, Darth Vader gives his life for Luke. And it, it matters. It means a lot. Um, if he had just give, if he had just killed the the Emperor without giving his life, I don't think the story would have been that good. But you know, the scene right. they're burning this, you know, his helmet and the skull in it is amazing. And and that's not the only example. Like recently, I was watching The Quiet Place. I don't know who's seen that. Um. But I don't want to give anything away. It's been out a few years, so it, if it's spoiler for you, too bad. Um, but the dad just making noise, just starting to scream to save his son and daughter, right? Uh, those things are just <laughs> such powerful moments. And I think you need to look for those, find those, and write those. Yeah, I, with mine, I... I have one book that spans three generations. So of course the parent, at least one parent is going to die, but the death has to mean something. How they die has to mean something to the child. So uh, Allison, you looked like you had a, um, a thought. Yeah, I was just, it's the same rules as any tiny killer character. It's gotta mean something. It's gotta have an impact. And you know, going back to what I said about these middle school age characters, um, parents are so important in their lives. They, with kids, especially kid protagonists, parents are their caregivers. They are the the buffer between them and the rest of the world. They are the source of food and shelter and and uh, anything. Um, and and that's just you know cold practicality beyond the source of nurturing and love and support. So even if parent is distant, and even if the parent is, uh, 
maybe there's an antagonistic relationship, losing a parent was really going to shock and shake up, um, especially a child life. Um, I mean, if you think about how much it would shake up and, and shock an adult, uh, with a kid especially, that just that changes their life so much. And I think that really? that's something to keep in mind. Um, just how is this going to change the world that these kids live in if your child, if your protagonist is a child? Okay. Ariadne, you look like you had an opinion on this. Well, I'm agreeing a lot with Allison. Like it changes everything. Um, if you know, if you're whether your character is close with their parents or they're opposing their parents, if the sudden death of the parent or even the expected death of the parent um, happens in the middle, it changes the plot, it changes the character, how they start to respond to the world. You know, it depends on the circumstances of the death as well. If it's, um, you know, if it's the bad guy kills the parent in the middle of your book, what then happens to your main character when that occurs? Like, do they, you know, go off on a revenge trip or um, do they shut down? How do they respond to the death of the parent? Um, it, I, it, it just, sorry. I was going to, no, keep finish, finish. Uh, no, I, you know, it's one of those, you just keep talking. Well, you, you made me think of The Lion King. The movie mm -hmm. The Lion King, which the entire plot hinges in of the death of the parent in the middle of the, of the movie, where uh, where Simba's father dies and he is made to believe that he's responsible for that. Yeah. Um, so the entire rest of the story is him coming to terms with what happened in his past and trying to move forward. Well, and one of you brought right. up the Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Um, Venice. Remember how we, yeah, but I was more focused on, uh, you know, the main guy, his mom it has cancer, right? And, and you see this over and over again. Like they just keep going back to it, showing his life, showing how he grew up. And then all of a sudden, you know, Ariadne said they can shut down. Well, this death occurred when he was little, but he his his dad says one phrase. I was so sad I had to kill her. Oh my gosh. And he shut down for a second. I mean, did you see how he shut down? That was great writing. It was great. Right. It was amazing. Kaylee, you look like you've got something to say. Well, honestly, a lot of what you guys have said just says so much what's been on my mind. But I mean, everyone has to go through the stages of grief, of that loss. Um, you know, even if it's um, someone who, uh, I even think of in Star Wars, since we've brought that up a few times, um, you know, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi kind of becomes a sort of father figure to Luke. So um, when we lose him, he's just, he had, he goes to that stage of grief. And because of that, then it affects the story and, um, you know, and it also affects the other characters as well. They, how did they respond to the character who just lost a loved one um, or to someone who like Darth Vader, you know, he sacrifices life and all these different things and what they have to go through in order to experience. And that really affects the story as well. Right, what about you, Charlie? I think uh, killing off a, a character often does help propel the the plot forward and having it be a, a parent can definitely do so in in really big big ways i killed off uh, a mom in the first chapter and i tried really hard to still give her a good personality before she died because it it creates this tension in my character where he wants to escape he has the ability to open wormholes so he wants to escape reality he wants to escape his life but at the same time he's also has this newfound fear of death and so he's worried about actually going to these other worlds and and dying there and abandoning his father so um killing off parents can definitely do big things for your characters i have a uh, one book that at near the end uh 
the father of two boys die in battle, one becomes king and the other decides to leave the kingdom forever because his brother's been abusive to him his whole life. And before the battle, the father had revealed, yes, I know what your brother's been doing, but I couldn't interfere because I know this is your destiny. And when it's time to leave, leave it behind, but uh, take your armband. They have armbands instead of crowns. Take your armband with you. It'll lead your child back. So um, sometimes the death of the parent is crucial and that becomes important, not in the next book, but the book after that, um, that father leaving and what happens with that. So uh, yeah, the death of the parent, if you have multiple children in the same family, it can definitely affect them very differently and what they choose to do with that how the children react. Okay, I guess we can open it up for questions now unless anyone else has some comments. Okay, I, let's I go ahead and change the, go ahead. How it changes the writer, right? Um, how having parents changes you as an author. Uh, when you when you write a character with parents, um, it's harder. I, I think that's actually why we ended up with this trope is they're like, you know, if I make him an orphan, I can just skirt around all this stuff and I don't have to do it. It's going to be so much easier. But when you create a character with parents, you have to create the parent child dynamic. You have to build their relationship. You have to make it a good or bad relationship. You have to spend significant time in pre-writing flushing that out and learning about it and growing it. And then you have to find out why and how you're going to use it in your novel. And, and I think it's a lot more work, but I think it has a higher payoff as well. Definitely. Well, and, and siblings as well, in addition to parents can definitely, there's more work and are they a team? Are they antagonistic? Yeah. You know, um, yeah, any family relationship colors your plot a lot. So let's go ahead and open up for questions. All right, so our first question is going to be from Jay Gosling, which is, we've had a lot about kids and parents, but what about adults and their parents? Is there value in bringing that into the story? Uh, my answer is absolutely, but go ahead, Ariandri. I've recently been watching Psych and the dynamic between Henry and um, Sean and then between Sean and his mom. And then you have the dynamic between the two parents because they're divorced and how does that affect their relationship? Um, so, uh, uh, you know, that's just one example of here's an here's an adult story with parents um they're still parenting even though he's you know in his 30s but um the dynamic has changed because of course they're adults sean gets to do more of his own thing because he is an adult legally <laughs> but you still see because he is rather immature through a lot of the show the dynamic of him and henry and how henry raised him so Right. What about you, Kaylee? I I was just thinking. I um I'm just about to publish a book where um the adult. I mean, she's 23, um, but it's it's still an adult, and she she's very affected by her mom still, and how her mom influences her decisions because her mom's kind of a helicopter, and she goes, "What? Wait, I'm an adult. Like I'm 23 and stuff," but she's still tied down by that, and how that affects the story. Um, even as adults, I mean, you're always going to have parents, whether they're alive or dead, um, as adults and stuff. And and they definitely affect you because they're the ones that raised you. So, Yeah, yeah how um, many times do you hear your mom's voice in your head? Why are you doing this? <laughs> Go ahead, Allison. 
Um, I was just saying, the book that I've got coming out next year, these boys essentially raise Cthulhu and then they tell their parents about it. And they're staying with their dad's grandmother as well. So the grandmother and the dad have attention because she's trying to help in certain ways. And he's very much the protective dad who's like, I don't want you guys any to kids anywhere near this monster. I know that fate has chosen you to deal with this, but it's my job. I'm going to take, off, take it on, even though I'm not qualified to do it. Um, so there's a ten- it's, so there is a tension there is tension there where the grandmother has her own ideas on how these boys should be treated and the dad has his own ideas and he's the parent he's the parent not, and she's the grandparent and so he's trying to make it clear that he wants to do what he wants to do. he he's going to raise his boys the way he wants to and I think that that's it's it's going on that way everybody's everybody's got parents everybody's got parents or right? everybody's affected by their parents, um, adults and kids. Um, and I think even if the parent isn't present in an adult story, the effect, like, like what you said about having the voice in the head, you know, why are you doing this? That the way that the kid was raised to adulthood could easily come into play, could easily cause tension, could easily lead to plot. All right, uh, Jared, you look like you had something to say. Oh, I always have something to say, but I, I like to let all the panelists speak. Um, you know, in in the Mercy Thompson series, right, you have this mechanic woman who's in her 20s, and she has, you know, a mom. She also has a father figure who, you know, basically raised her. And then she also has a divine dad that was one of the types of parents in our list, right? The divine dad, her dad is Coyote. And she's an adult and she has these three parental figures that she's constantly dealing with. Well, she doesn't deal with her mom very often, um, but the other two are pretty constant. And I think, I think that strengthens stories, right? You build these relationships. Stories in the end are about relationships. And, and relationships with your parents are so important even if you're an adult, and especially if you're an adult, it just means you've had more years to build that relationship and it's gonna be stronger, good or bad. It could be stronger in a bad way, stronger in a good way, but you've built that relationship for so much longer and that resonates with us as readers. We've built those relationships and we love we love to share that with our characters. Right. What about you, Charlie? I think it sometimes makes sense to bring in a- adult parents. Um, it just depends on your plot and your s- structure and things like that. I write uh, rather fast paced science fiction and fantasy. And so I usually don't bring them in because they would add too much complexity to the story where I don't need it. But uh, I- I'm thinking of like Blackish and uh, the Goldbergs, where they they have their their crazy fun parents but then they have grandparents and and older figures that come in and out of the the household and it helps drive their their plot with uh, these characters but for me i don't use it very often but it just depends on what type of story you're writing and the the plot line if it makes sense okay um so let's go ahead and go to the next question All right, so from Joseph Jones, I feel that the parents are sometimes static or don't fit with the character's arc. How would I remedy that? Do you want to go ahead and and start with that, Kaylee? Um, I don't know, it just gets me thinking a little bit more. That's an excellent question about um, the parents are static and stuff. I mean, I guess that's kind of what was mentioned earlier about how um, it's difficult to include parents. That's why we're like, let's just make them an orphan because you have to establish a relationship. You know, how do they feel about their parents and how do they affect them on their journey? Even if their parents might not be fully involved, they could still be in their head. Um, my character, the same one I want to publish actually, is she's um, she's not with her parents, but her mom is always rocking her mind. She's telling her something, reminding her of, um, hey, you know, is this the right direction? Um, same thing with her dad. She sees him as 
this this um, amazing person. She looks up to him, and so she bases some of her decisions off of him. And that's how I kind of include parents and make them a little less static by seeing, you know, this is the relationship she's developed with them. Um, on okay. that, within whenever go ahead, Allison. I was going to say, whenever you have a secondary character at all, they're affected by this adventure or this plot mm -hmm. as well. Like, uh, they might not be the story that we're focusing on, but they have their own stories. So if you're writing a story where your protagonist is, you know, up to their shenanigans or whatever, if the parents are involved at all, if they're present at all, then their story is, my child is up to these shenanigans. And that might affect them in some way. That They've got their own story. Even if you're not telling their story, you can see how that experience of having a child up to these shenanigans is going to cause them to change. Maybe to consider what their perspective is. Maybe it's going to affect them. And that can help make them more dynamic to the story if you take a moment to think about how would they react to this. Okay, it looks like we're getting close to the end. Um, Jacob, you look like you had something to say on this. Oh, no, Allison just made me think of Phineas and Ferb and the mom. Uh, you know, I just, I was just seeing the mom's reaction every time that Candace is trying to bust her brothers and, and how it's exactly the same every time. But she, even though it's exactly the same, you know, she's not a static character. Right. So, yeah, you need to remember the, the parent has a background, the parent um has their own story arc even though that's not the one you're telling that can help you predict what the parents how the parents going to react and their reaction can drive the plot forward yeah your parents should have their what about you your parents should have their own Go ahead, um, Charlie. personalities they should have their own quirks they should have their own um, goals and th that they're working towards i had this one scene I had somebody reach out recently that they they loved because they're like I could totally see my mom doing that, where my characters are talking between a, a door that's alive and so they're communicating between this door, and they shove some doubloons through gold doubloons through to the other side and my foster mom rubs them on her face she was so like so excited to get these doubloons and so you just have these little moments where you get a snapshot of their personality and they, they start to feel like real people, not just these static characters who are in and out of these kids' lives. Right. And if, if they're that static, do they need to be there? That I guess as a writer, that's one question. Ariadne, do you have anything to finish up? I was just agreeing with you guys. Um, if they're feeling static, you need to develop them more the, in the same way that you would any other secondary character. Because um, otherwise they will continue to stay the same and, and be that static character. Or you need to evaluate, should they be there as much as they are? Um, yeah, it's just, you know, those are kind of the two directions that you could go in. Okay, so in the last three minutes, let's uh, go ahead briefly uh, say a little bit about ourselves and uh, where we can be found. We'll start with you, Allison. Okay, um, Allison Hymas. I write middle grade. My latest book came out in September it's called The Explorer's Code. Um, and like I said, I've got one coming out next year. I can be found on my website, uh, allisonkhymas.com. You can also find me on Twitter, Facebook, and my blog, which is called The Story Fanatics at Blogspot. And you can find my books Amazon, Barnes & Noble, et cetera. Okay. Okay, Ariadne? Um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'm Ariadne Kane. Um, I have one book out on Amazon. Um, you can also um, purchase it at Barnes & Noble, but um, it's the... me but um i've got another one coming out probably beginning of next year so. okay charlie charlie pulsfer you can find me on 
Facebook, Instagram mainly, and then I'm also on Amazon in print, ebook, audiobook. Um, this book is no parents, and this book is involved parents. So you choose what you want. <laughs> okay, uh, Jacob right. or Jared, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, you guys can find me, you know, https jabrambarnick.com. I have a Trinity of Mind series, which is an urban fantasy that takes place here in Salt Lake. Um, you know, Firelight's book one, Breaking Glasses book two, book three is coming out this year. I'm an indie author. I am a full-time software developer, so it'll come out when it comes out. I don't have deadlines. I have a novella that's out, as you can see right here. Um, that's an epic fantasy, kind of, with, uh, you know, obviously it says winged ones. It's got people with wings. I, I love to write. I do it as a hobby. I've done it most of my life. Okay, Kaylee, quickly. <laughs> I'm Kaylee Cassett, and um, I am I'm newer to this um, newer and author thing. Um, I'm in the process of publishing a book called The Lady of Ingost. Um, I hope it will be um, getting into um, a good publishing company and be out for everyone to read. My um, blog is called K um, Your Kaylee's Greater Destiny at um, Kaylee's Greater Destiny .weebly .com. I know it's a little bit of a mouthful, but um, that's mine. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, and my pen name is VJO Gardner. Uh, my website is vjogardner.com. I have three books out now, one coming out very soon. And uh, you can get my books just about anywhere, um, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, eBooks. So uh, thank you for coming today.